Hello everyone and welcome back to episode 76 of the Knowing Wheel podcast. Yes, of course, as always, we are joined by Jamie183. How how are we doing, mate? I'm good. I'm uh, yeah, not used to the lack of F1 after we've been treated to three in a row and yes. now it's the three weeks off. But here we are. We're here to record a podcast anyway. We, we certainly are. We certainly are today. And this one is probably going to be one uh, for more of our visual viewers of the show. So we apologize in advance uh, that you probably have to look at our ugly mugs. I think everyone uh, is going to turn off the show right now. But yeah, we, we had a four week summer break, three action packed weeks of F1. And then they decided we're just getting another summer break again, which is pretty dead. Um, but that's that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. But of course... This week, then, it kind of meant because F1 news has been pretty flat. You know, you know, even the Formula One website is on a slow news day when they talk about how Charles Leclerc could still be world champion uh, <laughs> in 2022. We decided we'd, we'd take a step back into the past, didn't we, Jamie? Indeed. And we've got a few little news bits to cover before then, have we not? Have we? Have we? Well, there's a bit of development in the, the silly season. Rumor mill, yeah, not last much, week. not massively. It's not just... news; it's just speculation, isn't no, it? No, one of the bit, the Colton Herta bit is news. We'll go over that because okay, fine. Yeah, he's not fine. got we'll, the super we'll, license. We'll call points. it news. They can't yes, jam the super license. Um, so yeah, no more Colton Herta for twenty twenty three. Um, which kind unless of unless he does like Indian F four or something. Yeah, he does the Joe strategy and goes to GP three Asia and beats up a load of sixteen year olds. Um, <laughs> yeah. That was off off tangent already. Um, yeah, so he won't be going to Alpha Tauri next season. Gasly still is probably the favourite to go to Alpine to partner Ocon. Uh, yeah, it's uncertain future for Mick Schumacher still. Um, not sure who's getting Alpha Tauri. De Vries seems to be the logical option at the minute, but I, I want to throw Liam Lawson back in. <laughs> <laughs> if he if he if he dominates Abu Dhabi in like two months, then uh, you never know. Although well, Debris definitely will have the seat by then, so <laughs> doesn't really yeah, matter. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, what do you do with Liam Lawson? You can't surely do another year of F two, can he? He won't do. It. I don't think he'll do F two. It's, it's only his second year actually this year. Is it? I thought it was his third. No, it's, he was a rookie last year, so potentially. Oh, I suppose he could do Super Formula for a year. Mm, yeah, I don't. I don't really think he'll graduate to f1 unless no, they suddenly yet. get a third team at, at red bull family <laughs> um yeah it's a it's a shame but monza was just such bad luck for him but this is not about liam lawson although no. that's a smooth segue onto what our topic is about it is it is a very very smooth segue there i mean you haven't actually we, i haven't we i thought you were going to carry other alpha tarry options but yeah, we'll, we'll we'll talk. I think quickly. We'll, we'll, do we jump into your butterly smooth segue that now I've butchered? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So we thought today, you know, something a little bit different. Obviously, Formula One. There's, like we said, not really a lot of news going on. Hence why we managed to get it covered in about two minutes. <laughs> so we thought we'd look back into the past, and we had a notes page set down about a year ago on the show, back when it was still, you know, we were sort of in the early 20 episodes, Jamie still didn't know how to use his mic properly, you know, all those good <laughs> things. And one of the ideas we had was past F2 slash GP2 champions, where are they now, and let's give them a rating. So we've got a tier list today, you can see we've got obviously got, everyone knows how a tier list works, we've got different gravy, championship threat, potential race winner, decent midfielder, and Batmarker. And we have got every Formula 2 slash GP2 champion of the modern era. Plus Kamui Kobayashi, <laughs> because the only tier list we could find also included uh, GP2 Asia. Luckily, it was only Kamui that won GP2 Asia that didn't win GP2. So we're going to throw him into the mix as well, yeah. for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. It's going to be fun to look back on. And of course, even topical, uh, where Felipe Drogovic won the F2 Championship just a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, if you want to check out this tier list, uh, we'll link it down below. We, we didn't make it. Otherwise, Kobayashi, bless him, probably wouldn't have been here. But do we want to go in from most recent to oldest, or do we want to go oldest to most recent then, Jamie? I reckon we start with Drogovic. Start with the new. Should we start with Drogovic? Back. Of course, confirmed as an Aston Martin reserve next year. Apparently declined a multi-year IndyCar deal to be the Aston Martin reserve driver. Uh, that's not overly... I mean, I guess... I remember listening to a podcast, actually, with Alex Alban on it. And 
this is at the point, obviously, Albon did give up on his F1 dream temporarily to go to Formula E. And he said that decision was one of the hardest things as a young driver to, like, to close your doors to F1. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of get it for Drogovic to give it one more shot because, you know, if if Alonso realises this isn't for him driving around at the back anymore, um, then Aston Martin could easily just go to Drogovic, especially if his performances are good as a test driver. Like, he could just step up into that seat. Um, So I kind of understand why and i guess the indycar door will kind of always be there there's no point fresh off the back of a f2 championship just closing your doors to f1 completely i don't think so i understand that but yeah um in terms of the ranking i haven't actually you haven't shared your screen to me so i don't know what's going on oh i Um, (laughs) I, I forgot i disabled that again give me one Um, second yeah it's obviously hard to judge because he's only he's not actually raced in f1 yet um if he ever will um but yeah, I think he's he's definitely been okay. I wouldn't say he's top, but probably midfielder. Do you think if he got to F one? I market? think I was looking at it, and I think decent midfielder is a fair assessment for Felipe Drogovic. Of course, F two this year has been a combination of don't get me wrong, he's been the best driver there, uh, but the way he's been able to dominate has been fairly lucky of course a dominant f2 campaign is either you've got a lot of drivers that are very competitive as well that you've just got the edge on or a, you've got a few drivers that are pretty good that are either getting mecha chromed or just liam lawson over no, you haven't weekend. yeah haven't had much consistency any of his rivals at all so by finishing top five every race which yeah is very credible it, that's kind of how he's dominated he's not he's not won loads compared to poor chair um in terms of race wins but the consistency across the season has been very good. Exactly, exactly. I think we we wouldn't want to, you know, c- can I see them saying and Felipe Drogovic comes out the final corner to win the X, Y and Z Grand Prix? I'm not convinced just yet, especially if you're only an Aston Martin reserve driver. Mm-hmm. Speaking then, heading on to someone that did spend a lot of time winning in pretty much any car he's been given, finally, of course, going to get a gig in 2023. It is Oscar Piastri, and this one I am really hyped for. Yeah, I think that that line up next year, Norris and Piastri, is yeah got the potential to be one of the best on the grid. Um, we know Norris is probably top, at least top six on the grid, I would say, already. Um, Piastri yes. has had a better junior career than Norris did, did although he's been slightly older yep. through his junior career. Um, it is often forgot, isn't it? You know, people talk about how George Russell dominated GP two, sorry, Formula two even, and they go, but Lando was two, nearly three years younger, wasn't mm, he? Like yeah. Lando Norris could hang. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, Piastri is going to be ridiculously good when he's uh, when he's got settled in F one. I think. Um, yeah, obviously dominated F two last year. Um, well, in, in, in F3 three, the year F, before. F3 the year before, F4 the year before that. So, yeah. Formula Renault the year was before. Was it Formula Renault? Sorry. But, yeah. Formula Renault, Had yeah. to sit on the sidelines, as a, quite a few actual GP2 champions and F2 champions have had to do. Um, but hopefully it won't affect him too badly. No, no, exactly. And I think Oscar Piastri, you know, it really is going to be one of those stories, of course, of Alpine, the one that got away. I mean, Alpine now are talking about ditching their entire junior program, aren't they? <laughs> And you're like, stop throwing your toys out your pram and learn not to hire the pensioners and the French constantly <laughs> for eight year deals. It's it's not that difficult, surely. Just Matt's to back on his you Alonso know, agenda, here we go. Well the thing is, like, <laughs> don't get me wrong, like I'm not trying to say that Alonso isn't a good driver, but why when you've got such heavy investment in so many good young drivers, do you either A keep hiring a pensioner or B just set up a junior Formula One team. <laughs> it's not that difficult. I imagine it is quite difficult. It is very but difficult. But we, I mean, we've we've said this basically since this podcast began, haven't we? Yeah. Alpine need a junior team. Renault should have stayed as the main team, and they should have made Alpine as a secondary team in Formula One. Extra cars on the grid. They get more time to develop their power unit as well because no one else wants to use the Renault E Tech. Give us a junior team, Alpine, and stop messing us around. Indeed. Yeah, unfortunately, they've, my not rant's really got, over. they've not got loads of exciting young drivers anymore, um, unless you can't victimize them. It's because they're all going, because yeah. they keep hiring Alonso, and then he just yeah. walks out anyway. Yeah, but Piastri, back to him, 
obviously the where are you now is quite simple for him he's on his way to f1 um i would i don't want to put him in the top tier yet knowing some of the drivers no. that we have coming up um yes but i think second tier is definitely championship threat yeah. definitely. based on based on his world. um based on his junior career yeah. he should should definitely be very very good I don't see a world in where Oscar Piastri never gets himself into a championship battle. I, I, it's just impossible. Mm. Speaking of someone then that probably won't get themselves in a Formula 1 championship battle, uh, it is <laughs> young Mick Schumacher. Still, of course, up in the air where he could be going for 2023, if anywhere at all. I am honestly inclined to say he'll just stay at Haas next year, and it's going to be really anticlimactic. I think... I don't know I don't know if Haas are that keen on him, if he's not got the Ferrari driver academy backing um yeah i mm, i i would kind of like to see robert schwartzman get another go i think that's a very sideways move since they were teammates in f2 and were basically matching yeah. each other um and of course schumacher at this point has two years well basically one year since 2021 has didn't really count um experience but yeah i yeah it's difficult to see he probably will end up at house and it'll be really anticlimactic but yeah, he's been okay in F1. I think a lot of his performances have been quite unfortunate that they come in the races where you don't score points. Um, but yeah, he's not really putting Magnussen into the shade, which for a young driver, that's you should kind of be beating Magnussen, I think. But <laughs> if you want to really make a mark in F1. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it is one of those things, isn't it, of course? Because I think last year it was impossible to tell how good Mick was. And it, it does make me wonder sometimes... How bad Mazepin like, was. Well, how bad Mazepin was. But you also think, of course, had they kept Mazepin and Schumacher for 2022, Haas would probably still be last overall. Certainly no well, higher than ninth. I think they could, they could have snuck no out No higher than ninth, definitely. But the thing, you've got to remember how much information of course K-Mag with all of experience is able mm. to give them when it comes to setting up a car that of course Mick and Nikita just couldn't do and I don't think that would have improved much for 2022 no and they'd have been crashing into each other any chance they got a, a chance at points there's a fair chance that imagine now for one second K-Mag and Nikita Mazepin oh, dear. <laughs> that would have been carnage well luckily Mazepin probably um, would have been like three seconds off the pace but yeah, about that, yeah. I mean, it really does make you wonder, doesn't it? You know, just how slow Maspin is in comparison yeah. to top Formula 1 drivers. Yeah. But, Back yeah, I mean, Mick, Mick Schumacher, he hasn't he hasn't really kept up with K-Mag either for the most part. He's got better more recently. His quality results are a bit um, okay, but in the yeah. race, his Magnussen tends to, yeah, at least match him. Just but the then Magnussen edge. also just crashes into people for fun and then has to get a... I swear he's had, like, four black and orange flags this year. <laughs> yeah, but that's normally just been for like the wing hanging off and stuff yeah, like that. But then that's but, self-inflicted. You know, that's, so uh, sometimes, but you you don't like Kevin Magnussen. You've got a K Mag agenda. Remember? No, that. it's true. I think what's actually going on is K Mag is trying to get other people to back out of moves, and they don't. So K Mag yeah. is not one for taking anything, is he? Lying no, down. No. Um. But Mick Schumacher, though, I think I'm honestly going to say decent midfielder, but better than Drogovic. I think so as well. I yeah. can't. I cannot see. And Mick Schumacher emulates his father and wins a Grand Prix. Sadly, I I know it hurts no. a lot of people for me to say that, but I just don't see it happening. No, me, me neither. Moving on, though, Jamie, to our 2019 Formula Two champion, who now I would argue is probably the most hyped-up driver that hasn't yet got an F1 seat. That I'm still not exactly convinced is the real deal. I think it's. Massive overhyping, to be perfectly honest. It <laughs> was the perfect storm, the Italian it really Grand Prix. Was. The Williams was very decent at Monza. We kind of knew this. Albon seemed to know this from practice and pre weekend. He was he was kind of hyping himself up. Um, of course, yeah, unfortunately for Albon, got appendicitis, which really was really bad i don't know if we covered it last week but he's okay now we did discuss it yeah um yeah collapsed lung yeah pretty uh pretty terrible stuff but yeah nick de Vries, to come into that team at that race against that teammate you can't really ask for much more to make a first impression um no so yeah he did all it could be expected of him 
but I would back any respectable driver to have come in and done similar, to be honest. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I mean, like we said, it, it was kind of that perfect storm, wasn't it, of course, because that Williams, it was, it, uh, we've seen it quite often this year, it's not a bad qualifying car anyway, but of course, you, what Latifi said about it not being a race car is absolutely spot on. It's only designed to go very quickly down the straight, so the track mm. like Monza. And that means it won't be able to stick behind other cars through the corners. But of course, you're just banking on being ahead of those cars and then not being able to get past you down the straights. Which, to be fair, De Vries did do perfectly all weekend. Yeah. But we we don't exactly class Albon as a championship threat or a potential, eh, a potential race winner, I feel Albon could be. But I don't see Nick DeFries being any better than Alban at all. No, and he's twenty-seven. And he's twenty-seven. <laughs> <laughs> he's basically just the Dutch Giovinazzi. Which is a big, big issue. He is. He's just Dutch Giovinazzi at the end of the day. And but, yeah. I always thought Giovinazzi was pretty mediocre. Yeah. Um, yeah. Inter- oh, so I think we're, we're we're saying decent midfield. Though, yeah. I'm guessing. He's got. Fair. He's respectable. He's not going to take the F1 world by storm. But he's not no. going to be like offensive to the grid. Where do we put him then? Ahead of Mick, between Mick and Drogovic, or behind? I think Drogovic? he goes ahead of both of them based on his F two title was actually very decent. He Obviously, was also going it, up it against It was like Latifi. his fifth year or something. Um, yeah, but yeah, I think that's fair enough. Better than Drogovic and Mick Schumacher. Okay, now we get into I'd argue more of Formula Two slash GP 2s glory Gold, years, golden era. Don't until, we? until you get where to they really Julian Palmer. No, that that's that's really <laughs> when it peaked. It kind of fell off after that. Yeah. Let's go then. 2018 Formula Two champion. It's our boy George Russell. Indeed. And he's got to be top tier. I he's got to be different gravy material. Luckily, yeah. of course, a lot of these is a lot less speculation now because we're sort of looking through pretty well. All the next five all obviously got F1 gigs. Um, but mm. I mean, there's only two still on this list that didn't get an F1 gig. No, oh, three. Sorry. That didn't get a Formula One gig, yeah, but yeah. George Russell, of course, that Formula Two campaign was dominant. You know, we sort of hype up, you know, him, Albon, and Lando all making it to Formula One, but George was head and shoulders above the other two. Yeah, uh, and I mean, he's different gravy material. He's proved that rookie, Formula One hasn't he already. As well. In his yeah, rookie year in F two, uh, he's he's different gravy, isn't he? Jamie? He's beaten Lewis Hamilton he, in his first season as teammate. He is currently still ahead of Lewis Hamilton in equal cars, which yeah. there's only one other driver on this list I think can claim that, <laughs> uh, which we'll get to in, in quite a while. Um, yes. <laughs> 2017, though, we, we were actually talking as we were going through these pre-recording. I think this still, in my eyes, is the best Formula 2 campaign we've ever seen. It's Charlotte. Uh, yeah, he was top quality in F2. He was slightly helped... By the yes, fact it was a also very new true. new formula, effectively, because yep. 2017 was the new the new cars by Delara, so everyone was basically a rookie. Like yes. obviously, when rookies come in now, you're up against drivers who have one or two years experience in those cars. This year, or he was six up against if you're Roy Nassani. Yeah, he was up against uh, like Giotto and I can't remember who else would have been back there at that point. Uh, people like Markelov, but they all were effectively rookies despite having years in F- in GP2 because it was a brand new car. So, yeah, I'm not trying to hate Leclerc. He did a very good job. And he was extremely young to be rinsing everyone at that point. Um, yes. Yeah, he will, ho- hopefully for his sake, go on to great things in F1. <laughs> I know that's a wild I mean, he take. already has, hasn't he? <laughs> What do you mean, go yeah. on to wild things in Formula 1? He is already an incredibly good driver. I mean, like we said, I think he, he was something mad like he took 9 of 11 poles in his F2 yeah, season. Yeah. He just constantly was on pole with some, I mean, his Monaco qualifying lap where he hit the wall twice and still took pole by like yeah. four tenths <laughs> was absolutely incredible. We won't talk about anything else Leclerc's done at Monaco. No. Um, certainly, again, I think different gravy material. Yeah. Yeah, he's right up there. On, on when it when it's going well for Leclerc, we we might add, um, but better than oh here we go. This is going to get controversial <laughs> quickly. Is Charles Leclerc better than George Russell? I would say no. Good. I'm also saying no. <laughs> I mean, it's that not British it bias. Um, no, no. I just think Russell is a safer pair of hands. 
I Russell think, is a... an all-rounder better driver. Leclerc, I would argue, is quicker over... The, the thing is with Leclerc, and I know I've said this before, I genuinely believe Charles Leclerc might be one of the fastest one-lap drivers we've ever seen in Formula 1. For yeah. me, honestly, when you watch some of his laps, I see him right there with Senna and Lewis in terms of one-lap mm. pace. Yeah, and the amount of Some of the laps he can do is early, phenomenal. This early in his career, incredible. Um, but yeah, I think if I was a team boss choosing a driver to lead my championship charge, I would rather go for George Russell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Helped, of course, by the fact that obviously George has been a little bit lucky he's coming to Mercedes when there's not as much pressure because the car isn't that great. Mm. And obviously Leclerc's being stuck at Ferrari now forever, which is basically yeah, a death wish. That'll, that'll wear him down eventually. <laughs> That will, I mean, he'll be at, he will retire by 2025, I reckon. <laughs> I'm going to put up with Ferrari for that long. But yeah, I think those two are certainly, you know, we, we're going to see these two battling for championships over the next 10, 15 years. And they yeah. probably are two of the only young drivers on the grid that can hold a candle to Max Verstappen as well. Yeah. Uh, which, of yeah. course, is going to be incredibly important for the future of the sport. Yeah. Speaking of I someone wanna... that couldn't hold a. Oh, okay. I want to I wanted interrupt. The, uh, okay, I was about to do a perfect segue I then. Know, but... Unfortunately, um, yeah, this is the point. Obviously, in, in history, when GP2 became F2, uh, yeah, it's now. I thought this. I mean, the quiz could go anywhere this week, but I decided to put it here because it's kind of in the middle. Breaks it up. Uh, yeah, on on theme, on brand, as always. Um, there have been fifteen drivers to graduate from Formula Two slash GP2 into F1. Ooh. And score a podium finish in Formula One. Oh, that makes so it not, a lot more difficult. Obviously, the champions count. Um, yep. I'm going to give you a minute and a half podiums. because there's 15. Okay. Uh, some of them are on your screen, which will obviously they help. They are, yep. <laughs> yes. Uh, Massively. Some of, them, some of them won't be, which I'm sure will be interesting. But yeah, your time is going to start now. Kobayashi, Rosberg, Hamilton, Timo Glock. Oh, you're just going not through the of list. Not Hulkenberg. Roman Grosjean, um, Pierre Gasly, um, George Russell, Charles Leclerc, Lando Norris, Alex Alban, uh, Kevin Magnussen. Magnussen How many have I got? In F2. Did he not? No. And he's still got a podium in F1 on his debut. Uh, how many more have I got? There are six more, and you've got a minute. Six. I should have only given you a minute since like half of <laughs> them were on your screen. <laughs> Six more GP2 drivers that got a podium that didn't win in Formula 2. Um, Yano Trulli? No. He was, he's was. he been no. racing F1 since the 90s. Oh, yeah, he did, didn't he? I always <laughs> thought him and Timo Glock were similar. Um, Nick Heidfeld? No, never did F2. No. no. Um, or GP2. Trying to think of other drivers... Oh, I'm so bad at these, honestly. Did you Paris? say all the ones on your list? Paris? Oh, yeah, Paris did, yeah. Yeah, I said all the ones on the list. Okay. Uh, Pastor Malamado? So, yeah. There's I only might have forgotten about more. him originally. Four more. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of other podium sitters. Daniel Ricciardo? Never did F2, GP2. No. Oh, you've got five seconds, uh, by the way. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> that went quickly. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Time up. Um, so, I mean, what's that? Eleven out of fifteen. Yeah, not bad. Okay. Although about going. eight of them were given to you. So. Yep, very true. Uh, did you say Lando Norris? I did say Lando Norris. Okay, you got twelve out of fifteen. Then I didn't. I didn't. Oh, okay. Um, That's not so bad. So you missed. These are quite hard, to be fair. Um, you missed Vitaly Petrov. Oh yeah. Um, Nelson Piquet Jr. Oh Came yeah. Hockenheim, two thousand and eight, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, Heike Kovalainen. Oh, so I mean, I, I got all the more modern ones. That's fair Yeah, enough. that was quite hard. Those drivers, obviously you know who they are, but they're, they're not ones that spring yeah, to your mind difficult. when you think of... Welcome to, welcome to the world of winning, Heike. Yeah. Now there's the exit. Get out. We never want to see you again. <laughs> I was actually... I can't remember what I was listening to or watching. Um. Oh, yeah. The, I was listening to a, a podcast with Timo Glock on it. Uh, <laughs> and... They played a clip of Glock's first podium, like the commentary from his first podium, which was Hungary 2008. Yes. <laughs> and even, uh, is it, who was the old commentator for ITV? The one who screamed a lot. Um, 
James Allen? James Allen, yes. Uh, and he was like, hey, Kevin Allen's Lyons first Murphy race win. Oh, pretty winner. Yeah. And it's like, that will surely be the first of many for Heike Coverline. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Heike Coverline, I mean, we're best. going way off topic here, but Heike Coverline had such a bizarre <laughs> career. Like, he literally came he in, did. He joined like, Renault because Alonso He skyrocketed left, to the top. Got swapped with Alonso to McLaren, despite not doing much, and then spent two years at McLaren, and then ended up at a back right, car, though. and then was just gone. He got a podium later on in yeah. the year, but he had a it pretty up a and weird... down season. It's such a weird rise and fall because it all happened within like three years. He he basically did like a normal F one driver's career, like a fifteen year career inside five seasons. It was mad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Hakey yeah, we miss. I wonder what Hakey's doing list, nowadays. But... He's not. He is. Uh, he is not. Speaking yeah, of someone know. else that got promoted into I'll, a I'll top Formula drive quickly. too quickly, you're gonna research that quickly. I'm gonna slander Pierre Gasly then for you for a minute. Where where are we going to classify Pierre Gasly, Jamie? Of course, <laughs> one F uh, one GP two. Sorry, now I've got to remember to call it. Um, then had to go to Super Formula, bottle that championship because apparently blamed the wind. Um, I mean, then got obviously everyone. That was a everyone forgets the bizarre call up that obviously both he and Brendan Hartley got late on in 2017. Then of course, no, came Gasly back was going to be called up. Um, I thought they also yeah, brought Gas- in Hartley for a couple of races. Not at the same, not at the same time. Hartley was because science got pinched. Uh, Gasly was just because Kvyat was rubbish. But they were like one weekend apart, weren't they, or something? Yeah, that was like yeah. the bizarre back end of 2017. Yeah. And then Kvyat came back and went and came back and went and all this, that, and the other. Yeah. But Pierre Gasly, Jamie, I know you're going to hype him up a lot. I mean, but... I think there's an obvious place for him to go. Since he has won a race in Formula One, I think potential race winner is perfect for him, isn't it? Yeah, I don't. Not, not I mean, great. I'm honest about. I'm honest about my drivers. Um, I I try and rate them fairly. I think Gasly probably deserves a shot in his cop car again now that he's fully formed. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but not one I, with I Red Bull think, stickers on it. Not one with Red Bull or with Max Verstappen because he would he would take three years to recover again. Um, yeah, I think potential race winner. Obviously, he did win a race in Monza. Uh, hopefully, there's more on the way. Um, but if not, hopefully Alpine can give him a good car and he can absolutely rinse Ocon. Uh, yeah. Would Gasly, he rinse Ocon? It'd be close. I think I'd back Gasly, but I think it'd be very close. I would season. back Gasly to beat Ocon. To be fair, but still. Um, shall we move on then, Jamie? To probably one of the most hyped up F1 drivers. Well. Going into Formula One drivers of all time, was it the most dominant F two campaign? It was GP two yeah. campaign. Sorry, and he then it just by, all fell apart. He won by one hundred and sixty points, in which is F2, insanity. Yeah, when the likes of, uh, yeah, so most drivers win by about twenty to forty points, and Van Dorn won by one hundred and sixty. <laughs> to insane. be fair. We, we probably ought to caveat that, shouldn't we, slightly. If I remember correctly, the F- GP2 2015 grid wasn't that good. No, no. Second place was Alex Rossi. Then Sergio ah. Sorotkin, Rio Harianto, ah. Mitch Evans. It's all so. F1 backmarkers <laughs> and guys that didn't make it. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So Stoffel played GP2 in easy mode and then spent two years getting his behind handed to him by Fernando Alonso. <laughs> Yes, yeah. He did well against Jensen Button for one race. Or two races, yeah, that's actually. Because Button had penalties. Nah, Bahrain. Bahrain. Bahrain 16. No, that was really, wasn't it, where we were like, Stoffel's the real deal. Get him in an F1 they car actually, right now. They they literally kicked out Button a couple of years early to get Van Dorn in. Um, I think Button was happy to call it a day, though. I think he maybe would have done one more year. But then, driving that McLaren in 2017, he probably glad he didn't. Um, probably. Yeah, Van Dorn had a lot of potential. It was very unfortunate to be up against Alonso in a car that you really couldn't do much with. But, yeah. must also be added, did not crash at Singapore to help his teammate win a race. So he is better than Nelson Piquet. That's true, yeah. And he's also a world champion, if I'm not wrong. I don't he watch Formula He is a world champion, technically. 
So we're putting him in championship throw. Are we? <laughs> yeah, we didn't say which suggest? championship. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, Stoffel, isn't it? He's one of those weird ones, a bit like Nick DeFries, where you wonder if he came back now, what he would be able to do. But I can't say he's any better than Nick DeFries. I think midfielder is basically where he's for. Where or right to be ranking him in midfielder? Probably the best of those. I feel yeah. like his his stint in F one, at least he had a proper teammate rather than Kevin Magnuson, so he's better than Schumacher. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's fair. Fair enough. Let's get on then to. Oh, I mean, it's pretty easy, isn't it? He's going straight up in different gravy. Yeah, the best, the best driver in history. Um, the yeah. best driver in Formula One history. It is, of course, Lord Julian Palmer. 2014 yeah. GP2 champion. We will never forget lap 27 of the 2017 Singapore Grand Prix. <laughs> the greatest Formula One lap of all time. Thank you very much. Where we had Hamilton in the lead. 30 seconds clear of Palmer in P2. It was glorious. It made my day. I still remember it now. Nearly, well, five years later. Yeah. Five years almost to the day, actually. Since the... It is the probably pretty close. Screwed himself over. Yep. Uh... Actually, I was going to slander Palmer for having a really bad competition, but it actually isn't that bad in 2014 F2. No, his, GP2. his 4 GP2 2014 grid was quite competitive, but I'm going to caveat that by also mentioning I'm pretty certain he'd already been there for about three years at that point, hadn't he? Oh, really? I didn't know that. I think, I think Jolion Palmer did have a, a, a lengthy Formula oh, he debuted 2 in 2011. GP2 campaign. Yeah. <laughs> that was his fourth year. Oh, dear. <laughs> Yes. I mean, uh, let's be we'll fair. Take it back for a second. Palmer wasn't great in F1. I think that's fair to say. I, um, yeah. I, it hurts me to lost, admit, but five lost years quite I've badly. Grown. Lost quite badly to Magnussen. 7-1 in the points uh, in 2016. And then but lost he did score points worse. in Malaysia. Lost even worse to Hulkenberg um, across only one year, or even not even a full year as teammates. He was so bad they replaced him mid-season. Um, after Japan, yeah. I mean, yeah. I want to. I want to be kind to you. I want to put him in midfielder, but he really was just terrible. I I can't even argue against it when you look at the facts. He <laughs> he was a back marker, wasn't he? <laughs> but can yeah, we also add? Yeah. Probably has the best F one analysis that they've got hired. He is fantastic with that side of things on F1 yeah, journalism. Yeah, I barely watch... I don't watch much YouTube anymore. Um, especially not videos that this channel puts out. Um, but he on F1, that's one of the videos every every single time it's uploaded, I watch it. Julian Palmer's analysis. He is quality. He is a quality, quality analysis. Let's go on then to the real dark days of Formula 2. Uh, sorry, GP2. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying Formula 2 accidentally. And yeah. It's really annoying yeah. me already. We we kind of got into the years that have forgotten, haven't we? Where GP2 yes. saw some drivers that never made it to Formula 1, some drivers that spent all their time in Formula 1 crashing out, and some drivers that never could get podiums. Um, right. Fabio no, Lima, 20, 20, 2009 was serious again. <laughs> well, no, I wouldn't say so. Let's let's yeah, not go Fabio too far Lima. back, Jamie. Shall we do some let's ha where are they now stuff? Let's do some where was, are they now because he's probably the one of the, the ones we don't really know what he did. Um, and what he did was very little after winning <laughs> GP2. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He, Tell me more. So he won. He won the GP2 championship twenty thirteen. Uh, he won three races across the season, <laughs> and all he did since then was test drive for Mana in 2015 did a practice session at Hungary uh, competed in the World Endurance Championship in 2014 including Le Mans 24 hours and stood in for two rounds in the 2014-15 Formula E finished 32nd overall and then nice. he won something called the Ferrari Challenge Finale Mondiale results no the results is just the next word on Wikipedia he won whatever <laughs> Yes, so he didn't go on to much. Um, and that is Fabio Lima for you. Now, this was probably, wasn't it, one of... Because we can kind of understand, of course, everything else that was going on around Formula 1 at this point 
why we did have a couple of drivers that won GP2 that didn't make it to Formula 1. This was, of course, in a time when you obviously still had two of the three backmarker teams. Of course, HRT had already fallen off the face of the earth. And Manor and Caterham were just trying to get anyone with enough money in the bank to obviously get them on board. Fabio Lima, and I think we can probably bring Davide Valsecchi into this as well, were not bad drivers, but they weren't that much better than these drivers that had a lot of money behind them, but didn't have any money behind them, so no one was willing to pick them yeah. up. Yeah. Like, for those kind of teams, you think thinking like Max Chelson and Charles Peake were the the two pay drivers that they had at that point between them. So why would you drop either of those for Fabio Lima when all they're going to do is drive around at the back anyway? Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. It was, yeah, it was a rough time for GP2. The likes of Sam Bird, James Collado, Felipe Nazo actually came fourth in 2013. Um, yeah, Marcus Ericsson was in there, Jolien Palmer, uh, Robin Frins. Himself. Wow. That's Robin Frins, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it was oh. not not a lot of drivers that uh, no, I mean went on Fabio Lima could have been prime midfielder Formula E territory, um, yeah, but but apparently not. All then he of did course was we move over. Lucas Degrassi for, for yes. one race. he did. He certainly did. Then of course we move over to Davide Valsecchi, who a pretty similar story, except for I think he has done a little bit more since then, hasn't he, Jamie? Including getting slandered by. WTF one Matt years ago, who then chickened out and deleted his tweet. <laughs> Maybe never forget. I've uh, I've had a conversation with David Valsecchi. Very nice man. Um, Can you have a conversation with him? Yeah, yeah. He's really, really passionate about everything in real life. As about well. everything he talks about. Yeah, yeah. Like we were just talking about anything, and he was like, "Ah, uh, yeah, yeah." yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that. That was a pretty good impression of David Valsecchi. Um, it was. Yeah. So what's he got on to do? Uh, obviously commentated quite a, a substantial amount he to certainly has. GP2. Um, I really like him as a commentator. <laughs> um, yeah, he actually did very little racing after 2012. Uh, all he did, he test drove for Lotus in 2013. Um, didn't do any practice sessions, unfortunately, for him. Did a bit of GT series uh, 2014, 2016. And that was basically it. And he didn't he didn't get classified because he scored no points in the in, in GT series. So yeah, not uh not brilliant in terms of driving from Valsecchi, but he is a good commentator. He and is he shook a my very hand, very good commentator. So. And he did shake James' hand, so that puts him at the worst of the backmarkers, <laughs> right down here. <laughs> He's one of one of two drivers on this list that I've met. There we go. He is one of two drivers. Actually, who have I met on this list? I don't think anyone. Looking at it. Wow. Now. There we go. Yeah, I th- I'd put him above Lima because I like him more than Fabio Lima. So fair enough. And I mean, it's very, very difficult to judge with those two, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Who would have been worse off? Then we move over to Formula One's. Let's bring in all the crashy GP2 drivers. Roman Grosjean, I think the first driver on this list that won both GP2 and GP2 Asia. And yeah. uh, no, Valsecchi also did it Valsecchi did win GP2 Asia. Did he? Fair enough. Didn't, yeah. didn't actually know that. Also, though, to be fair to Grosjean, it must be added, did have quite a long Formula 1 career. Quite yes. a storied Formula 1 career as well. Yes. <laughs> and on his day, back at Lotus, was incredibly good. It's a shame that day happened about twice in, what, about 150 Grand Prix that he did. Yeah, yeah. Now, too, like, Grosjean, it's a, such a curious career. because there It's was, such a story of what if. There were such long spans of time where he was very fast and very respectable but it's a problem they were just interspersed with periods of time where he was just tragic there was there so, was a lot more time during those periods where he was awful <laughs> so like at his time at lotus 2012 2013 2012 more so was super inconsistent i think he got three podiums yes. crashed out on the first lap an awful lot obviously culminating in a race ban for spa 2012 but the then last 2013 get a race ban in f1 2013 he was certainly second half of the season quality first half he still kept crashing a lot while Raikkonen was just piling in podiums and being a championship threat um but second half he was the only driver outside of Red Bull to even have a chance of winning races 
And that's. I a mean, lot. there were a couple of races, wasn't it, where we talk about Sebastian Vettel being OP for those last nine races of 2013. Grosjean was sometimes his only threat, and a couple of times Grosjean was a real threat that people forget about. Japan, he made Red Bull work so hard for their one-two finish. Um, Japan 2013, he took yeah. the lead on lap one, and then yeah, led for like half the race. So, and Weber only got second place on the very last lap, I think it was. So yeah, and USA as well, I believe it was. He literally started like yes. last with engine penalty, still came through for a podium. So yeah. Yeah, Grosjean was Grosjean on his day. Has brilliant. He goes with the other Frenchman, in my opinion, potential race winner because he very oh, nearly. Oh, I'm got... not. Uh, yeah. Grosjean was. Yeah. He was so close to winning races. That's got to be potential. If we go back to twenty, are, you, are we honestly suggesting? Yeah, no. I suppose he probably is better than all those below him. Yeah, yeah. I start think that's yeah, fair. Yeah, not I, quite I Pierre Gasly levels, but no, he is no, definitely, definitely then, yeah, better than those his, below him at Haas as well. He was very decent in 2016, 2017. And then it just all fell apart as soon as Haas got fairly respectable. Um, and then, of course, it went out with a bang in, in Sakia. So, yeah. That's how you're choosing to I, frame that, are you? Yeah. I mean, it basically summed up his career, really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jamie. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll let that one We'll let that one slide, apparently. Yeah, we'll move on. Uh, then I, we will move on to basically another driver that pretty much had a similar story in F1, but just even more weird. It's Pastor Maldonado time, the people's hero, <laughs> the Venezuelan goat. The what a chance. bizarre career that was. Oh, I, I don't understand. I don't, I don't think anyone, even he probably doesn't understand Pastor Maldonado. He was I mean, just Pastor so Pastor Maldonado is not something you he understand. Was, He's like an he essence was, or a fragrance. No. No. He was just no. unbelievably fast on his day, but that happened. Sorry, you're what? lagging quite a lot. It, yeah, half a, I'll give him twice. Singapore 2012, he was going to get a podium, and then retired. And Valencia 2012 so until we'll he took out Hamilton. Yeah, yeah, 2012, he was good Singa until. The uh, sorry, 2012 Valencia. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think this is the thing, isn't it? That's often forgot about that 2012 Williams. Because, I mean, there's still conspiracy to this day, isn't there, about that car that weekend. You know, Frank Williams' 70th birthday, 10 years since Williams, or nearly 10 years since Williams last won a race. Which is mad now, of course, that that's still Williams' last ever Formula 1 win. Mm -hmm. But that car was quick on its day, and apparently that was basically just in Spain. Um, but Pastor Maldonado, again, you know, we, we can't really put him as a decent midfielder. Because not only was he a potential race winner, he was a Formula One race winner. Yeah. Somehow. <laughs> None of and us then, to this day quite know how that happened. Well, the FAA don't know either because they burned the evidence before they got a chance to prove it wrong. Well, they, they did, so... yeah. They got back and burnt the factory down. <laughs> but, I mean, what yeah. a bizarre time in Formula Spent One. Spent the second half of his career just crashing when the Lotus was terrible. Um yes. Yeah. When, when Le Grosjean kind of was able to still to tread water, Ro uh, sorry, Maldonado just kind of sank, didn't he, at yeah, that point? Yeah, He did a bit of World Endurance Championship. He came third one year in 2018-19 with Dragon Speed. Yep. Uh, entered Le Mans a couple of times. Um, never really amounted to much. And yeah, hasn't really done much racing since 2019 at all. Um, no, and that, yeah. that, funnily enough, coincides with Venezuela just collapsing in on itself. Yeah, so that, that kind of all adds up. Um, I don't think we can say he's better than Grosjean or Gasly, can we? I cannot believe no. we're living in a world where we're putting Stoffel van Dorn below Maldonado and Grosjean, but it is absolutely true. People just yeah. don't like to believe yeah. it. Yeah, honest opinion only. Real knowledge, 100%. Right, what I'm going to love is the next bit then, Jamie. The real <laughs> goat. <laughs> with, with the logic we're using today, you're going to be very upset very quickly. No, because he is a potential race, or he was. If you take it back ten years, he's going a potential what? race winner. I do not care. What? No, he, Jamie, you yes, never he got a is. podium. He, he's, he's in with your Drogovic's and your Schumacher's, no, not with your Grosjean's and your Maldonado's. <laughs> I'm sorry, Nico Hulkenberg got into Formula One, then got replaced by the superior Maldonado. He got replaced by money. Spent, is what happened. Then spent years getting his ass handed to him by Sergio. Are you Paris. joking? I am not no. having this at all. No, Hulkenberg is going a potential race winner. But he wasn't! And he now was. he's out forever. 
Win. If Alonso didn't cry on the radio in 2012 Brazil, he would have won that race by about a minute. What do you mean? Hulkenberg Alonso literally crashed himself out. Alonso asked for a safety car because Hulk and Button were winning by a minute. And then Hulk bottled it. No, the driver getting it was lapped Hamilton, bottled wasn't it, it by staying on the uh, staying on the dry line. He's always meant to stay on the dry line in the wet. Is that what happened? So you are you saying that Lewis at Imola last year was uh, okay then? Yeah. Oh, this is ridiculous. Yes, I am. No, yeah, Hulk's Hamilton going locked up, made the mistake. I, I, I'm willing to put him at the top of the midfielders, but he was no. never. He never. was. A, how could you say he was thirty He's laps from winning a race? He's the epitome of a decent midfielder. No, I'm not having this. Antonio Giovinazzi led laps in Formula One. We don't yeah, see me putting Hulk him in led championship on threat. Not because he hadn't pit yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry based on the metric we are using today i'm more than happy to leave hulkenberg at top of decent midfielder but i'm not putting him in potential race winner when he no, lived up to nothing <laughs> you got a pole position you're actually gonna rage quit he oh, did yeah. get a pole position in changeable conditions everyone was on dries he just got it by a set over a second right okay he's staying where he is I'm let, sorry. let us know what you think i'm obviously team hulk and matt is just trying obviously. to wind me up I'm not trying to wind you up. Based on the criteria we've been using, he is not on the same level as Maldonado, Grosjean, and Gasly. Grosjean never won a race. Grosjean got plenty of podiums, though. In the third best car. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like a you the third best car. Or he did for one Perez race. Perez still got podiums in those cars. Perez won a Grand Prix in the 2020 racing point. Yeah, which was the second best car that was still third in the race best. at that point. Well, yeah. But... I'm sorry, nah. Jamie. If Hulkenberg had not bottled so many podium chances, I would have put him as a potential race winner. Anyway, he's but still got a career. He's, he's coming back to Haas. Announce Haas. He's not World coming Champions. back to Haas. You he literally is. said half an hour ago how Mick Schumacher's going to get that seat. Yeah, but I can still believe. You can still believe in a he lot of things. He also won Le Mans, which fact. is a, a more credible season than uh, F1. Oh, behave. You know nothing about <laughs> Le Mans. <laughs> yeah, I hate it. You you always slander Le Mans until we talk about the 2015 race. And then you're Indeed. like, it's the greatest thing in the world. Yeah, I do. That's nice correct. OP Porsche and the only car with no reliability issues. Let's move on, Jamie. <laughs> 2009 to our final lost driver of Formula One. It's Giorgio Pantano. Now, please explain to me because I have no idea what happened to this specimen. Yeah. Well, first of all, he won F2 or GP2 when he was 30 years old. Um, <laughs> which is always a good start. Oh, that's incredible. So he basically um, spent a year as a 30-year-old man beating up children. In fact, he already had debuted in Formula 1 in 2004 oh. uh, for Jordan. Got a best finish. Was that in a Grand scenes. Prix or just in? No, he did a whole season practice. or most of a season. He... Did he? I completely yeah. forgot about this. Yeah, for the Jordan Ford in two thousand four. Uh, yes. Finished thirteenth twice and retired a lot of times. Um, and then a year later, made his debut in GP two. Um, so he, yeah, he was in the first ever season of GP two in two thousand five, and finished sixth. Then finished fifth in 2006, then finished third in 2007, and then won in his fourth attempt in 2008. Um, yeah, since then, he did a bit of IndyCar, a very small amount of IndyCar. Um, 20, well, he did 05, and then 11 and 12 as well. Uh, raced for AC Milan, which I wasn't expecting, in the Super League, <laughs> which I also wasn't expecting. Oh, I remember uh, that! That was bizarre, wasn't it? Yeah. And then that he did one season of Blanc, so Blanc Pan, or however you say that Blanc word. Blanc Pan GT3, yeah, yeah. In 2014. And he's now 43. Um, and now, I think the real question is, surely, with a story career like that, where was the A1GP race? Or the Formula oh, never, E race? Yeah, he, he never did, actually. He did some Auto GP, which I don't know what that is. Yeah, fairly similar. But yeah, yeah, nothing. He did Formula 3000, actually, before he uh, debuted for Jordan. Well, that was old GP2, wasn't it? Against, uh, actually, that's quite an okay grid. Although he was obviously 30 and did, uh, that was his fourth year in it, GP2. He was up against the likes of Bruno Senna, Lucas de Grassi, Grosjean, Maldonado, Buemi and Petrov. And all of those made it to F1, finishing second. So what you're seven. saying then is championship threat material, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe. Um, yeah, we don't know much about Pantado. And yeah, let's stick him in back marker. 
probably you cannot win GP two at thirty years old. I'm sorry, no, that, that yeah, should have been. The worst. I I'm I'm a firm believer in there should be an age limit in GP two. Probably yes, and Roy at Asani about should definitely be over it. Roy Nassani is yeah. However, Roy Nassani is it's a day younger than yeah. him. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's go back then, Jamie. I think the final four are all very very interesting candidates, aren't mm. they? Um, Timo Glock, the lovely Irish man called Tim. Tim, yes. Tim O'Glock and his team O'Glock. Um, I really like Tim O'Glock. I don't know what so it is about I. about mediocre German drivers who never want to race, but um. I just like all of them, you know, Glock, Heidfeld, uh, Hulkenberg, obviously. Yeah, I just think he's a really nice, nice character. Good, good, uh, very well worth a listen. His podcast last week on uh, the F1 Spotify. I can't remember what it's called now, Beyond the Grid. That's the one. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I he was unlucky not to win a race. Uh, if you if you think he's going in, if you're putting it, he's not above Hulk. I'm putting that straight out there. Um, but yeah. Glock was always decent. Only really raced for Toyota. Uh, he debuted with Jordan. Remind me um, again how many podiums Timo Glock got. Uh, three. Makes it quite easy then, doesn't it? Oh yeah, I can't be really bothered with this. <laughs> <laughs> he probably could have. in there. He probably would have won uh, the Malaysian race in 09 that got that got cut short. Um, because he was probably right. Probably he's a bit strong. Maybe not probably, but he could. He had a chance. Could have. Yeah. yeah, which which to me sounds like a potential race winner. It does, it does. Um, also came second in Hungary with a Kovalainen winning, which we've mentioned already, and second in Singapore, 09 as well. And yeah, he was, especially in a time when you had kind of the top six positions were all kind of locked in 08 and arguably 09 as well. I, don't know, I wouldn't say so. Yeah, I wouldn't but 08 say so. was like McLaren, Ferrari... BMW would have with a like just locked on top six most races. Um yeah, the fact he came tenth twice in a row in the championships, very respectable in uh two thousand eight, two thousand nine for Toyota. Yeah, um, and they were in odd years for Toyota as well, of course. And then mm. sadly for Timo Glock, of course, just got shafted by the financial crash and obviously Toyota leaving. Interestingly uh, so when... he revealed on his podcast that um end of oh nine when Toyota were leaving, of course, um he had basically an appointment with Renault to go and sign a contract uh, after the final race of the season. And then on the night before, we got a call from McLaren saying they were going to uh, look at his chances too to replace Kovalainen. Um, and he turned down that appointment with Renault to sign the contract to gamble on going to McLaren. Um, and then because Vodafone came in and wanted two British drivers, they went with Button instead. Well, I think so, McLaren wanted Button anyway, didn't they? Yeah, it's true. Glock was probably the backup. But yeah, he would have been at Renault, and that would have been a killer midfield team of Kubica and Glock. Yeah. That would have been top. But unfortunately for him, the uh, he kind of screwed himself by not going to Renault and risking McLaren, and then ending up at Virgin slash Marussia slash Manor for the rest Where of his career basically... in Formula 1. Yeah, a, a disappointing end for a driver with a lot of potential, wasn't it, Timo Glock? But he's yeah. gone on to do a lot of good things since then, hasn't he? In DTM, if I remember correctly. Yeah, he did a lot of DTM. He uh, competed in a couple of races this season as well. He done a bit of Bathurst 12 Hours, which you obviously know a lot about this weekend. No, that's um, the wrong Bathurst race. That's the Bathurst 1000. Well, it's still the same track, I did this it? weekend. Um, same track, yeah, completely uh, much different like you, Much like you, Glock DNF'd in 2017. Um so, he actually what, in the Bathurst uh, twelve hours. Well, in the Bathurst twelve hours in twenty seventeen, yeah. Fair enough. He's formed a very good relationship apparently with Felipe Massa, um, so much so yes. that he entered the stock car Brazil, um, and unfortunately yes. didn't get to race uh, because Massa was doing the first race of one weekend, and then Glock was taken over for the second race of the weekend, and. Uh, Massa crashed out and towed the car. <laughs> so Glock <laughs> didn't get to do his race. <laughs> That's very much just a Felipe Massa. That's for 2008. <laughs> it just yeah, throws yeah. it on a wall or something. Yeah, I mean, Timo Glock, I think, is always one of those, isn't he? I mean, we could, I mean, we could dedicate so many hours, like, down the line. Like, if, say, for example, we ended up with, like, a second COVID, where, like, six months without Formula One, we could dedicate so many hours to, like, these lost midfielders, couldn't we? 
sort of talking about their F1 careers. Yeah. But yeah. Glock, Glock, I think, yeah, definitely, you know, like we said, was a potential race winner. You might have noticed, Jamie, I have brought Hulkenberg up into that category for you. Oh, I didn't see but that. I, but I am to. leaving uh, Glock in front of him because he got podiums. Fair enough. I can live with that. Fair enough. Then we go, Jamie, to... I don't actually recognise this driver, to be honest. <laughs> Is I, he I the driver who, he made... who, who got beaten by Nico Rosberg and Equal Machinery? I, th- I think he might have been. Uh, uh, Lewis Hamilton? Ha- Hamilton? Yeah, something like that, yeah. I don't know what Tell me, what, what, what happened to this kid? Um, well, he managed to fluke his way into the best car in his first ever year and has still lost the title. Um, but he did beat yeah. his teammate, though, if I remember correctly. He won on count back. Come on. <laughs> uh, it's a win is yeah. a win, James. Obviously, a win is Lewis a win. Hamilton. We don't need to do where is he now because we all know where he is. Uh, losing to George Russell. Yeah. He's the best He's driver top of on this gravy. list. <laughs> he is. Yeah. I mean, let's be seven world championships. Could still, I know I've brought it up a couple of times, could be 11. If my grandmother had wheels, she'd have been a bike. As... Exactly, exactly. But <laughs> the fact he's gone into eleven championship deciders is madness. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, one of the one of the greatest of all time. You know, certainly top three ever in Formula yeah. One. I think there's no argument against that. Um, almost, of course, ended up at Williams. Is often forgotten. I didn't know. You that. know, That's after so end of two thousand and five. Um. Uh, Hamilton the t- uh, Hamilton and his dad wanted him to make the move up to Formula 1 they felt he was ready of course Rosberg was slightly older if I remember and of course had yeah. won GP2 that year um, but McLaren wanted him to do another year of GP2 Hamilton and his dad well his dad apparently from what I gather wasn't particularly happy with that so they almost signed a deal with Williams to push him into Formula 1 for 06 and that with would have Rosberg. been the end of no instead, instead of Rosberg of... if I remember oh, wow. correctly that is interesting. And that would have been a completely different career. He'd have been like How the Rosberg instead, basically. Rosberg could have ended up at McLaren in 07, yeah. Yeah. They that would, imagine they had like so. reversed careers. That would have been so weird. That would have been bizarre, wouldn't it? Although it wouldn't have changed much in the grand scheme of things if it was just completely reversed. Because, of course, they would have just ended up back together in 2013 anyway. Yeah. It would just be Rosberg might have had a world championship. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of which, though, Nico Rosberg. The goat. Mm. Six years yesterday that we uh, that he won the Singapore Grand Prix in 2016, which kind of almost confirmed his championship, in my opinion, because he was top level that weekend, and all season he was just on on this top of his game. Um, was he though? Was he Jamie all yes. season? I'm I'm thinking of a certain Monaco Grand Prix. Oh yeah, well, yeah, we don't talk about Monaco. Um, Say when he's not deliberately crashing. Oh, I've just realised I'm having a look on 2016 season. Yeah, the tier list went away for a second. I apologise. But I mean, we're not here to talk about how he deserves 2016 because Matt's going to argue with me for that. But he's got to be in different gravy. World champion in Formula One, called it quits. Still lives in the head of Lewis Hamilton rent free. Um, and he's a good YouTuber, so there we go. <laughs> if he's listening, yeah, we'll exactly. have you on the podcast. We will, Nico. If, honestly, mate, yeah, if you are listening, we will we will have you on the show. Different gravy, I feel, is optimistic. Oh come on, he won a world no, this championship. Isn't, no, this isn't me trying to slander. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> this isn't. But genuinely, I think we've also got to remember, of course, that that 2016 campaign. Don't yeah, absolutely that year he was on it. It was the best year he ever had in Formula One. No questions asked. You also cannot argue that it was one of Hamilton's worst years in Formula One. When yeah. you obviously his worst Mercedes year of all time, I would suggest. And Rosberg still only won that campaign by five points. I would put him honestly, and this isn't just me trying to like get under your skin or anything, I would put him as top championship threat, which he absolutely was. But different gravy is for those that could be multiple world champions, which I I really don't honestly believe you can argue. Had Rosberg won 2016 and decided to stay, when Ferrari were a threat in 2017, I can't help but feel he would have been slightly, not badly, but slightly left behind between Lewis and Seb. 
I think the first half of 17, Lewis was off his game still. Ferrari like, had a very good car and Mercedes weren't really used to having a battle of the no, cars for championships. No. But after Silverstone, I think it was, Bottas was like 15 points behind Hamilton. Bottas Rosberg also had a very, it. very good start to 2017. No. He did. But you can't say that Rosberg would have done worse than Bottas, I don't think. No, I wouldn't say he would have done worse than Bottas. I I but would I, feel very hard done by if he's not in different gravy. But he's not. He's, he's only a one-time he's beaten Formula 1 world champion. two seven-time world champions. One of them was a pensioner, and one of them had the worst year of his Mercedes career. Yeah, and whose fault Up was that? Now. His own. Some of it, yes. But Rosberg All got destroyed in 2015. He wasn't destroyed. Div- that, he was. His rivalry was, he was shocking. He was behind Sebastian Vettel by the US Grand Prix. Yeah, and his had like three DNFs from a, a one or two position that year. <coughs> Hamilton got robbed know. in 2016. He can go into a he can go in championship threat if you want. But I, I I'm, can. I'm, I'm, I'm nailing my colours to the mast, and he would be a different. I'm, I'm sure you are, but you cannot honestly suggest <laughs> Rosberg is a generational talent like Hamilton, Russell, and Leclerc. You, I would you put, just can't. I would take Rosberg. You, you can't, Jamie, Jamie. You can't. <laughs> No, Jamie, I'm sorry. You can't honestly suggest Rosberg is a generational talent. Let us like know. Industry. Rosberg and Hulkenberg, my boys, are getting absolutely slandered this video. You're lucky I put Hulkenberg up yeah. as a potential race winner when we all know we're throwing it away. I'm not having Rosberg in different gravy. I, I'm not allowing it. Let's go on then to our wild and wacky final driver of the list. It's the GP2 Asia champion, Kamui Kobayashi. Yes, and he was just like a cult hero in F1. He was. Uh, there was a, a time, Utterly I think it was bizarre. last year, or maybe earlier this year, where it was, it was just earlier mental, this year. the amount of videos well. that Kamui Kobayashi just got loads of uh, loads of recommended videos in everyone's sub boxes of him doing anything. And completely deserved, because he made F1 incredibly... Like, you had this, like we said, obviously, this bizarre era in Formula 1. You had Grosjean and Maldonado making it interesting, because you never know what they might do. You had Kobayashi making it interesting for what he was going to do. <laughs> yeah. He was and he bizarre, always... and we loved it. Yeah. And he always, like... He just... In a time where you couldn't overtake in F1, effectively, he just he made it look anyway. Easy. He was he was quality at that. He was never that fast, over, like over the course of a race or one lap. But he was just always exciting to watch. It was like, what's Kobe actually going to do next? Yeah, and the fact that he even was able to survive in Formula One was bizarre. Of course, you know, like we mentioned, one GP two Asia, but GP two he was awful. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think I made a video about this a few months ago, and obviously. Kamui Kobayashi's GP2 career was, and obviously the fact he then came into Formula 1 at the back end of 09 and obviously beat Button in his second Grand Prix, that was the equivalent <laughs> nowadays of Roy Burton. Nassani he... <laughs> he overtook him though he overtook Button, yeah he overtook Button, that would be the equivalent now of Roy Nassani getting an F1 gig next in Singapore and overtaking Max Verstappen yeah yeah, <laughs> it just doesn't which is make just sense. a bit. It, yeah, it's just ridiculous. He came sixteenth in oh eight and oh nine in in Euro 09, GP two. Yeah. Um, and yeah, debuted with Toyota, got a point in his second race, and then just yeah, drove for Sauber for three years. Was quite unlucky to not have a seat for twenty thirteen. Um, yeah, came twelfth every year for Sauber. Interestingly, uh, yep. got a podium in Japan, tw- yep. his home race. Uh. Yeah, unfortunately, ended up at Caterham for 2014. Actually could have... Yeah. Like, one thing I think people forget, in the first race of the season, if he hadn't... Could have scored points. Yeah, he could have scored points yeah. if he hadn't... Have he re ran at Turn 1, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he qualified 15th in a Caterham. Yeah, but and, there were only 18 cars that weekend, weren't there? Uh, No, there were 22. In 2015? 2014. He didn't race 2015. Oh, yes. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, but, but yeah, uh, no, it was 2015 Manor work now, wasn't it? Sorry. Yeah, 2015 Manor just didn't arrive. Um, but yeah, Kobayashi was always decent, always exciting, well worth a watch. And I think top end a decent midfielder, maybe below Van Dorn. Jamie, don't try to break the logic. You're not just putting... He was never close to winning a race. He was a 
podium winner and given the right car, I don't see any reason why he was any worse than any of those other potential race winners. True, to be fair. He was on a level with Grosjean Maldonado, for sure. There we go, then we'll put him between. <laughs> okay, <laughs> whatever. Simple as that. I mean, I, I was going to ask you whether we think anyone needs moving here, but I mean, I do. Not, we are not having this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just you enjoy that argument. As ruler of the tier list, I am dictating this result now. Uh, it's it's staying as it is. I think we've done pretty well there, though. I think for the most part, like the order apart, is pretty from, bang on. Yeah, apart from Rosberg. No. Yeah. No, because he's not on the same <laughs> level as those three. I'm sorry, he's just not. Okay. Let us know what changes you would make. I think we all know what I would make, but that's not we all not do. important exactly. anymore. Hence why we don't let Jamie control the tier list. You. Yeah. Yeah. Well. <laughs> but yeah, thank you all. I guess so much for listening slash watching. Nonetheless, you know, if you did enjoy something a little bit different. Uh, we would highly recommend you get yourself subscribed because, you know, over the winter break, I think we've got a four-month winter break this year, don't we, Jamie? Abu Dhabi's in November, so we're definitely going to do more sort of fun little videos like this uh, where we just go through and rant about past Formula 1 and look back over the history of recent years as well. But, yeah, make sure you get yourself subscribed as well uh, for more Formula 1-based content. And we will return next week, hopefully with some actual F1 news, but certainly more Knowing Wheel. <laughs>